As uh, you entered the sanctuary, you should have received a bulletin as well as an announcement sheet. I want to call your attention to a few announcements, but let me encourage all to uh, give us a record of your presence by filling out the friendship pad. If you're new also uh, to us, we'd like to have a record that you were here and would like to know how we can encourage you. Maybe you have questions about what it means to be a member of First Presbyterian Church or what it means to be a Christian or how you can know for sure that if you were to die, you would go to heaven and assurance of salvation. There's a little card in there as well, prayer cards. We'd like to uh, pray along with you for your needs. And then I want to mention a few announcements. The parishes this month for November have, uh, that have been meeting in the Youth Ministries building is the Brynwood and Westminster parishes. Starting next Sunday, Lakeside and Pleasant Home parishes will meet in the Youth Ministries building, which frees up some space here for visitors and also allows us to build uh, deeper friendships as we connect with those that live in our parish. Also, parents, I want to remind you that this morning, children worshiping uh, in the service grades first through fourth will remain throughout the service. They will not leave for catechism this morning. Children K-4 and kindergarten will exit as usual. And then this is the final week for collecting canned goods with the Golden Harvest uh, Food Drive, where our parishes have been collecting canned goods. And we'll also have an event where we'll celebrate that opportunity, uh, the Love Gift Dinner, next Sunday evening. It'll also be a pot potluck where we'll come together and, and talk and hear about how the Lord is using our diaconal ministries to meet the needs of those in our city. Uh, so be prepared for uh, finishing out, meet with your parish leaders and talk about the canned food drive opportunity. Then also uh, look forward to the love gift dinner next Sunday evening. During the meditation, let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. The Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient in all of life's needs, even through death. And God, that faithful one, calls us to worship. Would you rise as he calls you with these words, brothers and sisters? Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. 
It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The Lord be with you. Let us worship this great God together. praise this morning. We do praise you, God of glory, for we know that you are great. We praise you, God of mystery, for we know that you've revealed yourself through your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. We praise you, God of wonder, for we will spend eternity learning and marveling at your greatness. We praise you, God of nearness and tenderness and patience. When we fail, when we sin, when we're fearful, when we're confused, you come to us, you greet us, you change us, you make us new. And we're here this morning to live in your joy. We're here to celebrate your comfort. We're here to grasp the hope that is ours in Jesus. Strengthen us that we might worship you this morning through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The church through the centuries has found their strength not in their own following of Christ and their own efforts, not in their church, but in God himself. And they've used, as we use this morning, the Apostles' Creed to be reminded that our hope and strength is in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's repeat, recite these words together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Conscious Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we'll be reading verses 13 through 18, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the theme of our 
service this morning is facing death well, and we'll see in this passage the hope of redemption, and we'll celebrate in this baptism as well the hope of God's unfailing love. Passage is found on page 1840 in the Bible provided for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other, other with these words. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. We may wonder what a passage concerning uh, death and resurrection might have to do with baptism, but actually it has a great deal to do because in this book of 1 Thessalonians, Paul is writing to these Thessalonian Christians, encouraging them to live in the continuity of the faith. That faith that they have heard from their forefathers, they are to pass on to their children, and they are to live in that confidence that even if they should die, then the Lord Jesus knows where they are and will come and retrieve their bodies and join them together with their souls. And so he concludes the book with this benediction that you've heard many times. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you as faithful, and he will do it. These parents are charged to convey peace to this child. And uh, this child is to be taught that there is only one way to be at peace with, the Lord Jesus, with God the Father, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So from their earliest days, the children of the faithful learn that the gospel is the only way to peace and reconciliation. And then the harpers are to pass on to their covenant child and children uh, the way to live at peace with God, and that is to live faithfully and purely in response to His grace, even as He says at the beginning of chapter 4. And then He makes promises, which is what we celebrate in this baptism this morning. He makes promises that the one who has called them is faithful and He will do it. The one who has called them individually, the one who has called them together, the one who has called them to bear this child, this is the one who will be faithful and He will carry out His promise to them. And we take vows before the Lord as well that we will remind these parents and this child of God's faithfulness in order our lives before this little one. Uh, I was not so faithful in their wedding. My plane was held up and I missed their wedding. And uh, dad had to step in and do it for me and I'm appreciative for them. I'm glad to be here for this, for this um, baptism and glad that your shepherd, the chief shepherd, is the perfectly faithful one. Invite the harpers to come forward with their elder and take your vows before God and before His people. So let the Melissa I ask you these vows before God and before His people answer according to your conscience. Do you believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And do you profess Jesus Christ, God's Son, to be your Lord and Savior? Do you? Do you acknowledge that although our children are conceived and born sinners and therefore subject to the miseries of this life, yet Christ calls them holy, set apart, 
because of their relationship to you as members of Christ church, do you? Do you believe in God's covenant promise to be your God and the God of your children and thus present your child for holy baptism as a sign and seal of her reception into the covenant family of God, do you? Do you promise with the help of God to bring up your child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to pray for her and with her, and to make every effort so to order your own lives before this little one that you would not cause her to stumble, do you? And do you promise to encourage her as soon as she's able to comprehend its significance, to profess her own faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and become an active member of Christ's church serving faithfully in her fellowship, do you? Elder Morris, please pray for these parents to be faithful to these vows. Father, we are thankful for Elizabeth Christ, and we pray for her that you would bless her with every spiritual blessing, that she would grow in love and grace and treasure Jesus as her Savior. And I pray for Jonathan and Melissa. I pray that you would bless their marriage and strengthen that, that they would persevere through difficulties, that they would grow in their own faith, uh, stronger and closer to you, and lead this little girl in that faith and have the privilege of leading her to Christ as they claim your promise now as we mark her with baptism. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What name is given this child? Elizabeth Grace. members of First Presbyterian Church, do you receive Elizabeth Grace as an infant member of your covenant family? Do you promise to surround her with your love? Do you promise to pray for her? Do you promise to set before her such a life of genuine Christian faith and virtue that she might early in life know the reality of personal salvation and rich fellowship in the kingdom of God, if you can answer so from your hearts, would you answer, Amen. Amen. Elizabeth Grace, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray for this little lamb that you would take her into your arms and cause it to be that she would never know a day that she did not embrace Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And may she never wander, but may you keep her in the straight and narrow way all the days of her life. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said together, amen. God is tender like a parent to a child where he invites us near. He even invites us to tell him where we failed him. He'll never put us away. He will cleanse us 
strengthen us and go with us along the way. We'll start now with a time of personal confession for you to pour your heart out to the Lord, not in fear that he would reject you, but to know that you are cleansed by what Christ has already done on your behalf. And then we'll have a time of corporate confession. Let's pray together now. confess our sins together. Almighty God, you are generous in abundance. You have given to us gifts that we do not deserve. You have called us from death to life, granted us forgiveness through the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, given us the Holy Spirit and made us your children. You have provided for us, both spiritually and materially, Yet we have failed to be thankful and to rejoice in your goodness. We have ignored you and neglected to give you the praise that is due your name. Forgive us for our ingratitude. Give us eyes that see your hand at work in all areas of our lives. Enable us to realize that every good thing comes from you and deepen our gratitude so that we might serve and obey you with undivided and joyful hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the assurance of God's pardoning grace to all who belong to him. When the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. I stand and praise this God of grace. Father, we have experienced the gospel already in this service, and we pray that we would respond to it with gratitude and with a grateful prayer that you would consecrate the whole of our lives in such a way that others would see the good works that you produce in us, and you would get the glory. We bring to you our hearts this morning, even with their brokenness, some who've come here after having been with family or away from family have had wounds inflicted or exposed. We pray, O Lord, that they would experience your healing. All come here as those made in your image and are called to give you thanks, and those who know you in Christ Jesus do so willingly. We pray if there are those here who do not know Christ in a personal way, that they would grow jealous of the nearness of Christ's presence, and this would be the day of their salvation. We pray for those in our covenant family who are hurting. We pray for uh, Tommy and Vicki Jones who are grieving the loss of of Tommy's mother and ask that you would, uh, we thank you for the legacy of of faith that uh, you have created in that family and ask that as they grieve, they would grieve as those who have hope. We pray that you would get a name for yourself in those services. And we pray for Daniel Harris as he prepares to be deployed to Afghanistan and to a very dangerous service there, 
that you would continue to assure his parents that he belongs to you and uh, continue to give him confidence that the one who has called him is faithful and he will do it. And as you sanctify him through and through, we pray that his uh, comrades would see the hope that is with him in him and ask him to give an account for it and he would have opportunity. We pray for others who are in dangerous places too, for Tim Holland and Clay Edderly and for uh, Alan Grenells and Felix Mason, John Tucheron, Aaron Scoggin. We pray, Lord, as the gospel goes from us into the world, that you would uh, also get great victory. You would especially cause the kingdom of God to expand this day. We pray it in particular for these in our focus this week, Claire and and Toru in a way in Sudan, and as they have uh, supervisory responsibilities for the team in Sudan, would you help them not only as they take the gospel into a very difficult war-torn place, a very dangerous place, that you would also help them as they pastor their team, who has undergo- which has undergone uh, an undue amount of, of tragedy in the last few years. And in doing so, would you cause your church to advance in the Sudan and get a name for yourself there as well? We thank you, Lord, for including us in this forward movement of the church of Jesus Christ, not only by our prayers, but by our gifts, even as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated, and please pass the fellowship pad down your row. Peace of Christ.
Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 49. Those of you visiting with us should know that we are studying through, have been studying for the last couple of years through the book of Genesis. And we have more recently been talking about finishing well. So I want you to know as an Auburn fan that I'm not talking about death today just because of the game. I am talking about it because it was scheduled to be talked about. You can't finish well without dying well. And we finish well by dying well ourselves as well as taking care of those who have died before us in the faith and taking care of those around us as well, even as the, as the first century Christians did, which we'll talk about eventually. It's never too young then. You're never too young to start preparing to die well. I want you to look at the characteristics of dying well and taking care well and loving well those who have gone before us, beginning in verse 29 of Genesis chapter 49. <clears throat> then he gave them these instructions, I'm about to be gathered to my people. Now, this was Jacob talking to his son, Joseph. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of of Machpelah near Mamre in Canaan, which Abraham bought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite along with the field. There Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave in it were bought from the Hittites. When Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. Joseph threw himself upon his father and wept over him and kissed him. Then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father Israel. So the physicians embalmed him, taking a full 40 days, for that was the time required for embalming, and the Egyptians mourned for him 70 days. When the days of mourning had passed, Joseph said to Pharaoh's court, If I have found favor in your eyes, speak to Pharaoh for me. Tell him, My father made me swear an oath and said, I am about to die. Bury me in the tomb I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Now let me go up and bury my father. Then I will return. Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear to do. So Joseph went up to bury his father. All Pharaoh's officials accompanied him, the dignitaries of his court, all the dignitaries of Egypt, besides all the members of Joseph's household and his brothers and those belonging to his father's household. Only their children and their flocks and herds were left in Goshen. Chariots and horsemen also went up with him. It was a very large company. When they reached the threshing floor of Atad near the Jordan, they lamented loudly and bitterly, and there Joseph observed a seven-day period of mourning for his father. And the Canaanites who lived there saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad. They said, the Egyptians are holding a solemn ceremony of mourning. That's why the place near the Jordan is called Abel Mitzrayim. So Jacob's sons did as he, was command, as he had commanded them. They carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which Abraham had bought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite along with the field. After burying his father, Joseph returned to Egypt together with his brothers and all the others who had gone with him to bury his father. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. Thanks be to you, O God. Let's pray together. Open our eyes, O Lord, as we look at the gospel in this portion of the Old Testament. Open our eyes to see great things, and in seeing great things, cause us to be a great people, but a great people who bring great glory to you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people said together, amen. The eighth president of the United States, Andrew Jackson, was a skeptic for most of his life. <clears throat> he not only was a skeptic about the very existence of God, he was certainly opposed to organized religion of all kinds. He felt that organized religion uh, was simply existed to fleece the people out of their money. 
However, his wife was a strong believer, and on her deathbed, she pled with him to come to Christ, and he made a profession of faith. It seems that it may have been a real profession because uh, later, when he was president of the United States, he uh, was... uh, Uh, He was in Washington, D.C., of course. He was in poor health by the end of his first term. And cholera, cholera epidemic had come from Europe to America. D.C. was struck intensely with it, and his family pled with him to leave. He eventually did leave, but not until uh, several weeks later. And while he was on his way, finally out of the city, he wrote to his daughter-in-law, whom he loved dearly and who was greatly concerned for, her, for his health. And he said to her, we all know that we must die. And knowing that we must die means that we must live well in the present in order to be prepared to die well in the future. We must live well in the present in order to be ready to die well in the future. And so we will face death without fear. And when death does come, we will say, the Lord has done it. It appears, even though he had spent most of his life as a skeptic, the gospel had gotten a hold enough of his heart that he was able to face death bravely and was ready to live in preparation to die well for the glory of Christ. We can't test the sincerity of his heart, but it is a good and an apt word for us. Those of us who are called to be disciples of Jesus Christ, which means entering upon the narrow road that alone leads to life, not the broad road. The broad road by which we look like everybody else, where we blend in with the rest of the culture, where we don't stand out and don't bring too much notice to ourselves, but the narrow road, which necessarily makes us at times look like freaks in our culture. The narrow road at times, which is offensive to our culture. But the narrow road that follows Christ and those who see our nearness to Christ and the hope that He brings should grow jealous and follow us, even in the hour of death. Even as we are finishing, or even as we are taking care of our loved ones who have finished ahead of us, there should be a distinction about our lives that calls attention to the glorious hope that we have in the resurrection that we read about earlier in the service. And all of those distinctions are described or touched upon in this passage of Jacob's instructions, as well as Joseph's care for his father. The most obvious thing that's pointed out to us in this text, the most obvious way that we love the dead well in a way that gives evidence of the gospel is by grieving, grieving the past, grieving the loss of one we loved in the past. This is what Joseph did. In the first several verses, we see it intensely. Joseph threw himself upon his father and wept over him and kissed him. Later, we're told he was grieved for 70 days, only 30 days more than the embalming process took. The saints of the Old Testament grieved for long periods of time for their loved ones, even though they had the hope of the resurrection, even in the Old Testament. They grieved. They grieved well. Abraham grieved Sarah, as we looked at it in chapter 23. Joseph grieves his father, though he knows the promises that have been repeated to him in chapter 49. And Jesus grieved well his friend. Remember in John 11, Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus. And we're already told that Jesus... Uh, forestalled his arrival in Bethany for four days so that Lazarus would die. Jesus, the sovereign king of the universe, knew that his friend was going to die. He knew that he was going to raise him from the dead. Nevertheless, when Jesus arrives at the tomb, what does he do? He weeps. 
Chapter 11, verse 35, and later as well, Jesus weeps at his friend's tomb. And that word, that little word, wept, that we have, is it adequate to translate the long Greek word that is actually there? One of those Greek words which piles up a number of words to try to grasp the profundity of the emotion uh, that is characteristic of Jesus' experience there. Because that word is a combination of broken-hearted lament and anger. Jesus is not only broken-hearted that his friend died, he is angry that death has invaded his father's good world. This is not the way it is supposed to be. God did not create the world to die. He did not create the world for people to die in it. Death is an invasion of sin into the world. And Jesus, with anger and a broken heart, weeps outside of his his, his friend's tomb, even knowing he's going to raise him from the dead. We must grieve. Paul doesn't say, don't grieve. He says in 1 Thessalonians 4, we are just not to grieve as those who have have no hope. We are to grieve well. You know, the Jews had a, have a practice that is instructive to us called the Kaddish. And the Kaddish is a practice that's based on Kodesh, the, the Hebrew word for holy. The Kaddish is a prayer that a, that a Hebrew uh, believer or a Jewish believer is to pray every day for the 11 months following his loved one's death. He goes to synagogue any synagogue, anywhere around the world, and prays this prayer which extols the holiness and the greatness and the sovereignty of God. There was an editor for the New Republic, Leon uh, Viseltier, I guess, or Viseltier, Viseltier uh, whose father passed away, and Viseltier was not a, not a, a faithful Jewish attender at synagogue, but he decided to honor his father's memory by practicing the Kaddish every day for the next 11 months. Wherever he was in the world, he would go into synagogue and pray this prayer of about three paragraphs. And there were days when he said he was given hope by it. There were days when he was angry. There were days when he was sad. There were days when he was hopeless. But at the end of the process, he says, I stood in the ashes of fury and spoke the sentences of praise. I stood in the ashes of fury and spoke the sentences of praise. That is what the Christian does in his or her grief. We are angry at death as that last enemy yet to be conquered, as Paul says. But at the same time, we grieve, not as those who have no hope, because we do have the sure and blessed hope of the resurrection that those who die in Christ will live again. They will be raised at the last day. That hope is in contrast to the hopelessness of the unbelieving world. It was in stark contrast to the unbelieving world in the early centuries of the Christian church. There's a famous epitaph in the second century tomb that reads like this. I was not, I became, I am not, I care not. We don't say that as believers. We were not. We came into the world. And though we leave the world, we still are. And we do care even now until Christ gets the victory. Aldous Huxley sadly said to his sister when his mother passed away, I offer you no consolation because there is none to give. That is not our faith. Our faith is sure and certain. It is based on the the personal resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it is to His life that our bodies and our souls are united. We grieve intensely and humanly and recognizably, but we grieve with hope. This is the two-year anniversary of Michael Cave's death, 15-year-old son of our congregation. 
And um, shortly after, he died. And the medical staff, Medical College of Georgia, which was great in taking care of that family, the medical staff saw that they are real with their faith, and they grieved intensely, and they wept bitter tears. They collapsed at moments with their grief. But they also sang around his bed as he was sick, and we sang around his bed when he died. A resident said, or a, a, the med, a medical, uh, uh, the, the uh, physician who was attending to Michael said to one of our residents later, she said, I thought I knew Christianity, and I thought I was teaching my children Christianity, but I obviously don't know the true faith as they knew it. After the first service, Beth Cave told me that on the one-year anniversary of Michael's death, she took a, a basket of fruit to the medical staff. She doesn't even remember doing it. And one of our current residents was there the day that that fruit arrived, and she asked what the story was. And the medical staff gathered around and said, let's tell you, let's just tell you about this family. This family's faith was so real that after he died, they gathered around him and sang. They stood in the ashes of death and fury and sang praise to God as only the gospel of hope can enable us to do. To die well, to take care of the dead well, is to grieve well. To love the dead well, to love Christ well in the hour of death is also to take good care of the body. It is to prepare for that. You notice that, uh, that uh, Joseph fell on his father's body and hugged him. Uh, he was a Jewish, he was a Hebrew believer. He had a believing cosmology, a view of the world, which was not like our common view of the world. Our common view of the world is Platonic, according to the fourth century Greek philosopher Plato, who said there's a sharp division between the spirit and the earthly. And he says the body, he said the body is a prison house of the soul, so we should try to get away from it. And when it's dead, we should get rid of it, we should burn it, we should destroy it. And so if we're not careful, it's times we can talk about our body as that shell, that thing that's not true of us, that's not us. Throw my body in the ground, toss it away like an empty carcass because I'm not there. That, those are not believing sentiments. When Jesus Christ drew you to himself, he drew your soul and your body. You are united to him as a whole. And when your soul is disembodied, when your soul goes to be with the Lord, you are you. Your body still resting in the ground is you. And Jesus holds both of them. And someday he'll put them both back together. And so we give testimony to that, that, the, that fact that the body is united to Christ as much as the soul by the way we care for the body. We're not worshiping the body, but we are giving thanks to God for that person whom we only knew in that body by the way we care for that body. This is the way Joseph cared for his father. He invited his personal physicians to take care of his dad and to embalm him. It was a common practice. And the physicians in Egypt, even in a pagan worldview, they didn't see a distinction between the living and the dead. The physicians in Egypt took care of live bodies and they took care of dead bodies because they were bodies. They were people. So Joseph said, entrusted his father's body to the physicians who cared for him so delicately that it took 40 days to ply their craft. We take care of a body of a deceased one because it is dignified with the image of God. And as a believer, it's united to Christ. It's not just a shell. It's not something to be thrown away. It's not something to be treated with indignity. And 
while we're dealing with the body, we are doing so as a demonstration of hope. Here is a liturgical drama, as some have called it, that occurs in a funeral. It is less and less the case in America that funerals are important, that any time is given to the planning of funerals or conducting of funerals or much less taking care of the body. But in the Christian, in the Christian faith, we conduct funerals as a liturgical drama, a strong testimony to the hope that we have in Christ. Here's the tradition that we've inherited from the ancient church. In the ancient church, the, the Christians on the day of the funeral would go to the home of the one who had deceased, who was deceased, and they would accompany that body with a caisson to the church. And the, the casket would be wheeled in or carried in, feet first, passing the baptismal font that was in the back of the church in those days, symbolizing that's the way you come into the church. He would pass the baptismal font where that one had been baptized most likely, and feet first brought into the sanctuary and lined up feet first, just as they did every Lord's Day when they came to worship. The people would come and they would worship and sing and celebrate and hear the word preached. And then they would accompany that body feet first as it was leaving the sanctuary to the grave site. And there carefully they would entrust that body to the grave and give testimony to the fact that this one had been the, had been the recipient of God's mercy from the beginning of his life through the middle portion of his life being brought into the church of Jesus Christ and now was being accompanied by God's providence to his resting place and placed in position to see Christ when Christ returned from the east. Everything they did gave testimony to the reality of the gospel they professed and it was regarded as freakish by their unbelieving contemporaries, especially in the Roman world, they thought these people had surely lost their mind. They called them all kinds of awful names, even cannibals, for the way that they took care of the dead person as a testimony to the gospel. They didn't get that tradition from any other place. It was brought to them entirely through this, that Jesus Christ had become flesh and because he had become flesh, he united their flesh to his. And because their flesh belonged to his, and he still lived as a body in heaven, that body was to be treated with dignity because that body someday would be called forth from the tomb and would be reunited with his soul. We are in a state, we are in a, an era, or becoming more so, when we have opportunity to give just as much of a testimony to the liturgical drama, the reality of the gospel with which we've been visited that gives us a blessed hope beyond the grave. The final way that we give testimony to the gospel is by the way we actually bury a body, that we take the time, that we engage in the expense of taking care of a body and burying that body. Augustine said in the fourth century, when he was giving instructions to Christians on how to live distinctly before a watching world, he said, you must avoid cremation and take the time and energy to bury your, the Christian body because that one is united to Christ and that one has worn that body all of his life. And by instinct, you want to take care of their clothing and you cherish their rings that they wore and so forth. Why not their body? And what's more, look at the care that was extended to the body of the Lord Jesus, put into a tomb from whence it was raised to life. You too must treat the body with such distinction. I want to be very sensitive to those of you who have already gone through difficult things and maybe you've chosen cremation. And I've actually counseled cremation at times for overriding circumstances. So I don't want, I'm not being legalistic. But for the vast majority of us, cremation should not be an option. Because the origin of cremation comes out of pagan religion, 
which was offended by the body and did everything it could to destroy the body and to show its disdain for the body. Now, I can tell you without going into detail that, that um, as responsible and professional as morticians are, they'll tell you themselves that a body is not handled as carefully that is headed to the crematorium as it is if it's going to be buried. My seminary students, I take through these things and instruct them in these kinds of special services. I force them to go with me on a tour of a funeral home, the back rooms of a funeral home. There's nothing that focuses you for life than touring the back rooms of a funeral home. Every one of you should try it. Uh, morticians are more than happy to show you their, their back rooms. And you'll see that a body is not cared for in the same way headed to the crematorium as it is for burial. There's a lot that has to be done to it to make it fit into an urn. And again, if you've chosen that, I'm not speaking indelicately. I don't want to do that. But to say for those of you planning for the future that here is your opportunity. This is the last great opportunity for us to demonstrate to the world our confidence in a blessed hope, the resurrection of the body. And everything about us should be distinct and different. When we care in such a way for the way we plan a funeral, for the way we care for a body, for the way we lay it to rest, if we care for those details in a believing way with an eye to witnessing, people take notice. There's one of our members whose who's relative died an untimely death a few years ago. And because of the careful and believing way they went about that funeral, another unbelieving relative said, I want to go where he's going. Without saying anything political, I don't mean to even intimate something political, but it does seem to me that we are entering into an age that is more like the New Testament era than, bef than ever before. And I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the opportunity for us to demonstrate our faith in a way that is truly distinct and forces the unbelieving world to take notice. It's happened before. When Julian the apostate was the Roman emperor at the end of the Constantinian era in the 360s, Julian the Apostate thought that Rome's problems were uh, due to the Christianizing of Rome. That if Rome would just get back to its old pagan roots, everything would be great again. And so he set on, he knew not, to, not systematically to, to, to uh, destroy Christians in physical ways, but he harassed them and he made fun of them. He tried to make life as difficult as he could for them. And at some point in his reign, he lamented that he could not make progress against these impious Galileans. Because he said, these impious Galileans, these atheists, that is, they were atheists because they didn't worship his gods. These atheists forestall all of our efforts to take Rome back to its, its roots because of the way they take care of the poor, not only their own, but ours too, and their honesty and the way they care for the dead. Now, their honesty was, was obvious. They lived what they professed, and they, they were willing to, go, to become poor for it. They were willing to die in faithfulness to Christ. They cared for the poor by taking up offerings, by storing up grain, and providing not only for the church, but for the poor, their poor neighbors. And so Julian said, our people run to them like children for candy and follow that Galilean. And the Christians took care of the bodies of the deceased. They, they buried them in a dignified way. And when they found corpses from Roman citizens thrown on the trash heap, they dragged them out and they cleaned them up and they dressed them, and they buried them with dignity. 
And Julian the apostate, the mighty Roman emperor said, even I am not powerful enough to compete against a religion like that. Brothers and sisters, we've entered upon a narrow way. We're called to take care of our poor and the poor around us. We're called to live in truthfulness and faithfulness to the gospel that God has given us and all of its tenets, even if it costs us money, even if it costs us death. And the way we face death and the way we take care of the dead, the way we engage in funerals is to give testimony to a real and living Christ in such a way that the unbelieving world, even the powerful, they can, they can hate us or they can love us, but they cannot ignore us. May that be our calling. May we live in that calling for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would give us the wherewithal by your Spirit to live for Christ whatever the coming years may bring, whatever persecution, whatever difficulty. May it be that Christians are known for their care of the poor, their own, and others. May Christians be known for their faithfulness and their honesty, no matter what the cost. May this church, may Christians be known for the way we take care of the sick, the way we defend the unborn, the way we defend the elderly, the way we take care of the dead. O Lord, in making us strong in Christ, would you get a name for yourself? In Jesus' name we pray. benediction. And to him who is able to keep you from falling, 
to carry you over and to present you before his glorious presence, blameless and with great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ before all ages, now and forevermore. And this kind shepherd go with you and carry you all the days of your life into his peace. Amen.